Welcome, everybody. I am very excited to talk, talk to you all today about Frog Watch and what it is and um, even how you can kind of participate in it. So maybe we'll end up with some new exciting um, and excited members today after you guys learn a little bit about Frog Watch. Go ahead and change. All right, so in case you're wondering and aren't sure what Frog Watch is, it is actually a citizen science uh, citizen science program that happens all across the United States. So the technical name is Frog Watch USA. I usually shorten it to Frog Watch because it's easier to say. Um, and it is hosted by local chapters all across the US, um, which means that organizations all across the United States can decide if they want to host a chapter and then they manage the local citizen scientists that uh, do the observations and volunteer through Frog Watch. So there are um, over 113 chapters across the United States um, when I counted in December. So we have quite a few chapters all across the United States, but if you are in a situ situation where you'd like to start a chapter, please reach out to me because I would love to have more chapters than that. Um, we actually did start in 1998. So we have been collecting data for 26 years for this. this so this year will be our 26 year. So um, as you can imagine, that piece of the citizen science part um, really does allow you to do like long-term data collection, which is exciting because it allows us to show trends and you know how things are changing and all of that. So we did begin in 1998. And our job, and basically what we're looking at, is we are collecting the data on frog and toad breeding calls. So we are out there um, in the evenings listening to the boys advertise to the girls so that they can make some more little frogs or toads. So that is what we do. We collect the data on the breeding calls and the weather and the location and that kind of information, which we'll get into all of that as we go on. Next. So why do we do this? Um, because there has to be a purpose. As much as we all love frogs and toads, we don't wanna just you know, collect data for no purpose. So part of the benefit of the data is that we can describe what local species are where. So looking at where you can find different species, um, like I know, like I know our Ohio frogs pretty well, but our frogs outside of Ohio, I don't particularly know that well. So, um, you know, looking at our local species diversity and kind of how that might change. Um, Frog Watch has also helped to detect rare and invasive species that are occurring in different areas. Um, so all across the United States, depending on where you live, you may have invasive frogs and toads, and they are taught as well so that the volunteers in those areas can actually um, list them out if they do hear the invasive species or the rare species because there are endangered amphibians all across the United States. I believe there's 43, 43 endangered amphibians, not just frogs and toads in the United States. Um, it also helps to tell us when things are changing. So 26 years worth of data does allow us to see when frogs and toads are shifting their areas. Um, and that might give us clues to what might be going on out in their native habitat. So changes in their diversity, changes in where they live, maybe even changes in their life cycles, phenology, their life cycles over time. So looking at that kind of thing, maybe shifts in when they're calling, when their breeding season is, if they might change their breeding season based on things like climate change. Um, frogs and toads are also um, an indicator of wetland health. So if you think of the phrase canary in a coal mine, frogs and toads were the kind of original canary in the coal mine for wetlands, because if bad things happen in a wetland, the frogs and toads are usually one of the first ones to tell us that something is going on. And that has to do with their life cycle being amphibians. Um, so if you live on land and you live in water, then a lot of times you get the best and worst of both worlds. So if something is gonna happen, a lot of times they're the ones that tell us first. And then the data could also be used to inform the development of land management. Like if frogs and toads are being reported in this particular wetland, especially if they're endangered or a species of concern, then that this data can be pulled and used by developers to maybe not develop over top of that wetland or maybe make sure they leave room in their development for that wetland. So there's lots of different benefits that can be pulled from the Frog Watch data. And one of the exciting things about Frog Watch is that we are an free open source data. So anybody can pull the information anytime they want to for any purpose. So we do have college students and things writing reports and other organizations using data 
to kind of guide what they do, especially park systems. They use the data to kind of guide what they're doing within their park system. Next. So when we're talking about frog watch though, as much as we love all amphibians, uh, we do specifically focus on our anurin friends, which are specifically our frogs and toads. So they um, do have some, kind of some quick, easy rules to tell the two of them apart. Um, but as with anything scientific, nothing is ever 100%. So I always like to compare it, you know, well, all mammals give live birth except for the platypus and the echidna who lay eggs. So these are kind of, we like to call them almost like quick and dirty rules to be able to tell a frog from a toad. So if you're looking at a frog or a toad in your yard, how can you tell if you've got a frog or a toad? So for the most part, um, frogs actually have a smooth or slimy skin. So they are your more aquatic um, species. So they tend to be found more in the water, hanging out on the banks of the water, and they're going to be kind of very smooth and be kind of slimy to the touch. Um, they also, interesting enough, when they lay their eggs, they lay them in clusters. So in the bottom picture there, you can kind of see, we've got a couple of wood frogs there um, in Amplexus, where the, that's the term used for frog and toad breeding. Um, so you've got the boy frog on top and the girl frog on the bottom. And he's helping her squeeze her eggs out. And then her eggs are all over in the water there. All those little black kind of jelly-like dots that you see in the water, those are frog eggs. And frogs just lay their eggs in mass. Like it's a big mat of like jelly-like eggs with black dots in the center. Eventually those black dots become tadpoles. So frogs just lay their eggs in huge giant clusters in the water. Um, Frogs also tend to be very kind of skinny with long legs. Uh, we like to compare them to like Olympic swimmers because they spend so much time in the water. So if you picture like Michael Phelps or Kelly Ledecky, Katie Ledecky, um, if you picture them, how tall and lean they are with long limbs, frogs are gonna be the same way. They're gonna have tall, like long thin bodies with long legs that allow them to swim and cut through the water more uh, hydrodynamically, more, you know, more effectively. Um, because frogs and frogs do have those long legs, they actually are really good jumpers too. So they are your ones that are going to have the big old leaps and jumps as they move around. If you're trying to catch one, they're going to jump three feet away from you into the water um, and get out of out of reach so that you can't really catch them or find them. Um, and then interestingly enough, frogs actually have, we should really put quotes on this, upper jaw with teeth. So they don't have teeth like what you and I have, but they actually have plates in their mouth that are kind of like grinding plates. And if you think about it, they eat things that are slimy and slippery and wet because they're eating things that are in the water, fish and things like that. So they want to have something to grab a hold, to be able to grab a hold of that food. So they kind of do have quote unquote teeth in their mouth. Now, next we'll talk about toads. So toads now are are more of our land friends. Whoop, my light went off in my room. There we go. Um, <laughs> so toads have very warty, dry skin. So they're not the slippery like frogs are. They're your little warty uh, guys that you find on land. And you can see in the picture down at the bottom here too, the toads, that's an American toad. Um, they lay their eggs in strings. So those strings with white dots in them, those are actually their eggs. So they lay them um, like a string of pearls almost, or I like to compare it to like rope lighting. If you've ever seen that, where it's got the clear plastic tube with the lights singly in it, that's kind of what their eggs remind me of. So when they breed, they lay long strands. So their eggs are very different in the water too. So you can actually glance and tell. Um, toads are usually found on dry land, hence the warty dry skin. Um, so they're the ones that you typically find in your gardens or your yards kind of hopping all around and about um, because they are typically found on dry land. And because they don't spend so much time swimming, they tend to be built more like an Olympic wrestler or something like that, kind of where they're short and stocky. Um, they're not as good at leaping and swimming as their frog counterparts are. 
So they have little fat bodies with little short legs um, and they move in little short hops, which makes them a lot easier to catch. Um, <laughs> I know I've caught many toads in my life, but they do have little short hops as they move about your garden or your yard or your, in your bushes or something. And then they don't have those teeth either because they're catching bugs and things that are on land and not nearly as slippery. So that's kind of quick and dirty what the difference is between frogs and toads. Um, now, like I said, none of those rules are hard and fast. We have a frog here in Ohio that has warty skin. So a bumpy warty skin. So technically um, it one, it's kind of weird and breaks the rules, but that is kind of, if you're looking at them, just a real quick glance, you can kind of tell if you're dealing with a frog or a toad. All right, next. So a lot of people ask, why, why do we do frog watch? Why is it important that we work with, you know, studying frogs and toads? And they're actually really important species. Um, not just because they're cute and we love them, because if you guys are on here, I'm hoping you think they're cute and you love them too, but they are important for other reasons as well. Um, so one of the biggest reasons is they actually benefit the natural world and humans. So they're a huge benefit um, and they benefit in so many different ways. One of the main ways they be benefit like the natural environment is that they are both predators and prey in the ecosystem. So if you imagine that food web that we learned about in school, frogs and toads fill in that middle section. So they, if they were pulled out of that web, you can imagine the top would collapse and the bottom would collapse. Um, so they are very, very important to the ecosystem and helping maintain that healthy ecosystem. Frogs and toads are also huge at pest control. They eat bugs. And a lot of them actually eat mosquito larvae, which is a bug that nobody likes. So um, they are amazing at pest control and maintaining and cleaning up all of those options, all of those pest animals that we would think of. So they're really good at that. Um, they are food. Um, a lot of people will actually hunt and eat, especially the bullfrogs and the larger frogs like that. Um, there's a frog down in I think it's like a Caribbean kind of area that is actually called a chicken frog because the locals say it tastes like chicken. So there are frogs that are used for food. Um, they're also used for medicine. A lot of people don't realize that there are different chemicals that frogs will produce for various reasons. Um, a lot of them are for protective reason reasons like toxins and things that we actually have taken chemicals from and used for medical purposes. There's a bufin, bufotoxin is a toad toxin that is actually used in like blood pressure medication. Um, I know there was a, there's a frog from Africa that was used quite a while ago, but for many years as a pregnancy test for women. Um, there's also a frog that is currently being studied to help with organ transplant because this little frog has the ability to freeze solid during the winter months. And they're looking at the cells of that frog to see if we could use that to help organs to last longer while they're in transport to the recipient. So they're being used in all kinds of medical things, which is really exciting. Education and research. So things like Frog Watch, just you know, all kinds of the education and research just being done on frogs and toads to see what else they do. Like they're, they're indicators of a wetland health. They're also provide all of these amazing things to people. So all the education and research that goes into frogs. And they're actually culturally significant. So a lot of people think, oh, I mean, I guess they're probably in stories that the indigenous people used years ago. They're probably in those. There's also a very current day culturally significant frog. Um, I don't know if I wanna say his name, but he's green and he plays the banjo and he's got a girlfriend who's a pig and he sings about how it's not easy being green. So I'm guessing most of you might know who that is, <laughs> um, but they're also culture. Yep, I see that. <laughs> nice job, Emma. <laughs> so they are very culturally significant to us too. They're, they're infused throughout our culture. But one of the reasons we study them, like I mentioned before, is that they serve as indicators of environmental health because they are very sensitive to the environment. Um, part of it is because they actually have something called permeable skin, which is skin that soaks everything into it. So frogs and toads have the ability to breathe through their skin, which is helpful when you're swimming in the water, but they also means anything that touches them is absorbed into their skin. So that's why we always recommend if you do catch frogs and toads, make sure you wash your hands really good because if you have lotions or perfumes or soap or anything on your hands, it can be absorbed through their skin. Um, 
they just, they, they suck everything up because their skin is so thin and permeable. Um, which means that if there's anything in that environment, the frogs and toads are going to suck it into their bodies and their life cycle. Like I said, amphibian literally translates to amphibios, amphi meaning double bios meaning life. So all amphibians live a double life where part of that life is lived in the water, usually with gills and part of their life is lived on land, usually with lungs. And because of that, they get touched by everything in the environment. So they're very important and they do serve as those important indicators of health. Next. So um, another reason we're really looking at frogs and toads is because of the declines that they've been facing. So I, I don't wanna depress everybody, um, but the next couple of slides will kind of talk about the declines that are facing frogs and toads and why we think it is so important that we do these observations and get this information out there. So yeah, over the past 20 years, there ha they have shown dramatic declines in the amphibian populations. Um, the IUCN, which is an organization that puts out like a red list of endangered or critically endangered animals and that kind of thing, they just completed their second global amphibian assessment. And they have discovered that there are over, at this point that they know of, over 8,000 amphibians living in the world. So all across the world, IUCN is an international organization. So all across the world, there are over 8,000 amphibians. Of those 8,000, 8,000, um, 41% are actually threatened with extinction, which is almost 2,900 animals that are threatened with extinction, just in, 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 in amphibians. And there are 222 that are believed to have gone extinct. Um, either they are extinct or there's no known surviving populations. Nobody can find them anymore. Um, now, one of the really scary numbers, because those are sad, but the one of the really scary numbers is that 11%, almost a little over 900 amphibians, we know they exist, but we don't know anything about them. That's why citizen science programs and things like Frog Watch are so important because they help us to collect data so that we can learn more about these species. Now in the United States, I don't think we have any of the data deficient animals. They're more down in like South America and Central America, but anything we can do to collect more information is good. And it allows us to see how these animals are doing. Um, and that actually, that number has gone down since the first global amphibian assessment that the IUCN did. So they're really working hard on trying to get as much information about frogs and toads as they can. And then at least one third of all species are declining in population when it comes to amphibians. So those are some kind of scary numbers. Um, and in the United States, we have 43 amphibians that are listed as critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. So kind of some, some sad numbers. Now you may be wondering like, what is going on? What is causing these declines? And I will talk about that on the next slide. So this is taken right out of that report. Um, I kind of cut this page right out and put it in here. So these are the main threats that are, why our amphibians are declining, like what's going on with them. So if we look, that biggest circle there, that 93%, it's habitat loss. Um, that seems to be one of the things that just is affecting animals worldwide. Unfortunately, a lot of animals just can't handle it. They can't deal with it. Because um, if you don't have a place to live, I don't know how long you're going to be around. And some of it can be habitat loss due to the, the habitat being just gone, being wiped out for deforestation or agricultural purposes or development of infrastructure for people. Um, some of it is just degradation or the breakdown of the habitat due to things like pollution. Um, and that is leaving our amphibian friends with no place to live. So 93% of amphibians have habitat loss affecting their populations. Now, the next number down, 29% uh, of our amphibian friends actually have climate change as part of their problems. So when you are a little cold-blooded animal, like frogs and toads are and other amphibians, you rely heavily on the climate. Your body temperature, you can't maintain your own body temperature without help from the outside. So if the temperature and the weather is being weird where you live, um, then it really affects you. It messes up your breeding cycle. It may mess up your feeding cycle. 
So climate change as a whole is really affecting a lot of amphibians. Um, climate change is also driving some of the weird weather patterns we're seeing. It's driving, you know, the storms, the increase of storms that we're having, as well as things like the fires and whatnot. So that's really affecting a lot of amphibians. 22% um, they're being affected by disease. Unfortunately, there is a fungus going around. It's called uh, we call it chytrid for short because you can see the word there. It's chytridiomycosis, um, and it's caused by a fungus, and it's causing a lot of amphibian declines. Um, so it's kind of a a scary fungus that's affecting our amphibian friends. Fire, twenty one percent. So whether they're human or natural caused fires, uh, that kind of that kind of ties into the whole habitat loss piece. But fire specifically is twenty one percent of the uh, declines, causing the declines of the amphibians. Invasive species, which is something that Frog Watch can help to track to some extent, um, is also a problem. So it's not only invasive things like frogs that are, you know, living in areas and out competing other frogs or even eating um, <laughs> smaller frogs, but it's also one of the problems we have here in Ohio, where I'm located, is not in invasive frogs, it's actually invasive plants that are messing up their habitats, their wetlands where the frogs and toads could be found. So we have a lot of invasive plants that are happening. And then 9% is just over exploitation. So uh, over exploitation due to pet trade, pet trade is scary across the United States, uh, but also you know animals that are harvested for medicine or food um, is causing problems. But the biggest one by far is habitat loss that is affecting our little frog and toad friends. Next. Now that I've uh, depressed everybody, <laughs> let's cheer it up a little bit and talk about, well, what can we do? We know all this is sad, but what can we do to make a difference for all of these amphibians and frogs and toads in particular? The main thing that I like to teach people about, um, because I do, I work at a zoo and I'm in the education department at the zoo, um, as well as managing Frog Watch. Um, one of the main things that I like to tell people to do that education and engagement will help us to save whatever it is that we're talking about, help us to save the world. Because if people don't know what's going on, they can't jump in and make a difference. So you have to educate people so that they know what is happening in the world. Because if you can't know, you can't, if you don't know, you can't fix it. And then also engaging them. So not only knowing, but engaging their hearts, engaging their passions um, so that they're interested and they want to make a difference. And that's where citizen science is so amazing because it engages so many people that may not have thought that they had a chance to make a difference, but they do. So by participating in things like Frog Watch and other citizen science programs, anyone at all, you're engaging with the natural world usually and engaging in science in some meaningful way that will help to make a difference. And all of this tends to be tied together. So in education and engagement is such an important piece. And that is what is going to make the difference is making sure that people get engaged so they have the they care and then also educating them on what to do once they care. Um, another important thing is regulations. Um, and one of the things like I can't change person regulations, I'm one person, but I do have one vote. So making sure that people pay attention to who they're voting for and what they're voting for um, is also a really important way that you can address the threats affecting animals like frogs and toads all across the United States. Um, and then that ties into management too. A lot of management is done through our park systems. So making sure you support your local parks as best you can, because I know a lot of our best habitats for these frogs and toads and other animals and things are found in our park system. So supporting your local or national parks is really important too. Um, and when you can, using the data that's collected from citizen science to inform that management. So making sure that the parks have access to it. Um, research, so you know what you're talking about. So you know what you can do to properly address the threat is super important as well, which is where Frog Watch ties in. Researching and monitoring where those frogs and toads are and what they're doing and how they're surviving where they're at. So all of that ties into one big pretty bundle to help us address the threats that are affecting frogs and toads for Frog Watch specifically, but animals across the world. All right, next. So Frog Watch, because it's for frogs and toads, takes place in wetlands. 
So um, on the next two slides, I'll actually be talking to you guys about what are some wetlands that you may find frogs and toads in. Oh, I'm gonna talk first about what they are. <laughs> so uh, frog watch is collected, data is collected in wetlands. So that's because that's where frogs and toads live and where they breed specifically. So since we are listening to breeding calls of frogs and toads, yes, happy belated wetlands day. Um, <laughs> very exciting day. Um, but frogs and toads need the wetlands because that's where they breed. So that's what we're listening to. So we need to monitor in the wetlands. And wetlands are basically, defined by three things. Uh, you want to have plants that grow in saturated or wet conditions like cattails. You want soils that lack oxygen, so soils that are so saturated with water that they don't have any kind of oxygen in the gaps between the particles of soil. Um, and then you want water at or near the surface during some part of the growing season. It doesn't have to be there all year, but just some part of the growing season. All right, next. Okay, um, so there are, yeah, there are quite a few different kinds of wetlands. If you're interested, let us know at Frog Watch and we can go over a bunch of those. Now, uh, one thing that you have to do if you're gonna volunteer with Frog Watch is you need to have a site. You need to have a place to go to do your monitoring. So um, sites are, kind of, are managed by local chapters. So you can work with a local chapter to find a site. I actually, at my chapter, have um, some people that use their own backyards if they've got an amazing wetland in it. But we also have people in parks that go out and uh, manage at their, you know, manage their sites at their different local parks. So if you are gonna volunteer with Frog Watch and you wanna choose a site, uh, you wanna make sure that any site you go to is legally accessible. We don't want anybody arrested while they're doing citizen science. That's embarrassing. So uh, we wanna make sure that any sites that are chosen are legally accessible. We wanna make sure they're convenient to access because we all know we're human. If your project is not convenient, you're not gonna do it. Um, I know if I had to drive an hour to my site just to sit for five minutes and listen to frogs, I probably wouldn't do it. So you wanna make sure that wherever you're participating in your citizen science, that it's convenient for you. Um, since we are listening to breeding calls, so since we are listening to frogs and toads calling, we want it to be pretty quiet. So you don't want a lot of noise that will drown out the frogs and toads. And you wanna make sure that it is safe for data collection in the evening. Frog Watch is a program that does take place after dark. So we require you participate at least 30 minutes after sunset because frogs and toads like the dark. Um, it's you know, safer for them to be out and about when animals can't see them. So yep, uh, when you're looking at sites and things, you wanna make sure that you can do this in the evening um, and where you're going is a safe location for you to go. Next. Question about that too, cause someone popped yeah. into the chat and I had a very similar question. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen mentioned, I have a man-made small pond in my backyard with green frogs. Would that qualify for Frog Watch? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, the uh, ponds, I actually survey three ponds and they're all man-made. They're all retention ponds that we have here at the zoo, but the frogs don't care. <laughs> so absolutely. Um, as long as there's, you know, it's not like a chlorinated pool, but actually like a pond with vegetation, it is absolutely a great site. Um, do you have any resources for anyone who's trying to build their own? By chance, we could to come back build to build a pond. Too. Yeah, or, um, or the man-made version of ponds that end up being um, like a haven for frogs or amphibians nearby. Um, I know people do that with like bee hotels, for example. Okay. Um, I do know there are like I don't know of any resources off the top of my head. I do know there are people that will help to build ponds. Um, I'm going to a local conference in a couple of months next month um, where the, one of the speakers is gonna talk about how to build vernal pools in your own Ooh. backyard. So there are resources out there. I just don't know of any off the top of my head. Excellent. Oh, and actually I'm glad you uh, said vernal pools because we, I forgot our podcaster might mention that on the next one. So stay tuned for the podcast because he has vernal pool information, Ooh. which might be what you're looking for. There you go. All right. So once you've chosen a site, then what you want to know what you're going to do. So you want to know what you're going to do before you get out there. So we do have monitoring protocol because we do want this to be very scientific in the data that we're collecting. So we want everybody to follow the same standardized protocol. 
Um, so frogs and toads are kind of picky little guys. <laughs> um, we like to say that they're kind of like Goldilocks, can't be too hot, can't be too cold, can't be too hard, can't be too soft. Um, so they do want particular weather conditions. Being cold-blooded ectotherms, I mean, it makes sense. Um, but in order to do monitoring for frogs and toads, uh, it does need to be above 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it needs to be raining not too hard or be not too windy, um, which there we do have a Beaufort wind scale, which is next, um, I think the next slide. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but you want to make sure that's how you can kind of measure the wind appropriateness for frogs and toads. And I have been out on sites and had a kind of like a mini storm kick up. And as soon as it started raining a little bit harder and the wind picked up, the frogs and toads went silent. So they really are picky little things. Um, and we do ask that you monitor or you plan to monitor at least 30 minutes after sunset. And then for frog watch, we require that you monitor your site at least once a month throughout the season. And the season does go February through the end of August. So um, that it tends to be across the United States, the most common breeding time for frogs and toads. Next. So there's that wind scale. So frogs and toads are good up until about 12 miles per hour. <laughs> um, after that, we actually uh, say, go ahead and stop monitoring because the frogs and toads will probably be quiet. Plus, you know, there's always the idea of if you're out in the woods, there's some safety when the wind kicks up a little bit like that. So the Beaufort wind scale is actually a nautical scale that Frog Watch uses to help you gauge how fast the air, the wind is moving and at what point it is too windy for you to uh, be out there monitoring. So that would be something that it would be helpful to learn if you're choosing to do frog watch and we do have trainings and all of that available, but we'll just, I just wanted to show this to you that this is kind of how we decide. And after that three point, after that 12 mile per hour, we do say, don't monitor that night, choose a different night that month. Next. So our yep monitoring protocols, like I said, February through August. Now, when you go out to the site, we do have pretty strict um, parameters around the time period that it takes. We ask that you do like a two minute acclimation period um, where you, cause you know, humans are trompy and we make lots of noise. So um, you get out to your site and then you just kind of sit quietly. It's actually very meditative and restful also, um, but you kind of sit quietly for two minutes at your site. And after that two minute period, then you'll want to set a, a stopwatch or a timer or something, and you're going to listen for precisely three minutes because we want the, the whole observation to last three minutes. And it, during that three minutes is when you're going to listen to whatever is calling. Um, so during that three minutes, you'll listen, you'll identify and remember your breeding call so you can report them on your data sheet and all of that information. So you wanna just do the data during that three minutes. Um, we also then ask if the session is interrupted, then you restart including that acclimation period. So um, because that I've heard the frogs and toads get scared or go quiet at different noises. And so you kind of have to restart um, the whole thing and give them two more minutes to get used and settled down and realizing nobody's gonna eat them before going back into your three minute observation. And then we have people during that, you also record different weather stuff, but you record the call intensity of the species that you're hearing. So on the next slide, we'll talk about call intensity. So when you're out there, you're listening to your frogs and toads, um, you know, you've got all kinds of different calls happening, but you're listening for your frogs and toads and you're reporting what you're hearing. Now, one of the things I like to tell our citizen scientists is even if you don't hear anything, it is still good data because frogs and toads call in different environments in different parts of the year. So the little ones usually wake up first from the freezes and the cold weather because their bodies are smaller and that their metabolism is quicker to get started back up when it warms up. So you'll have your smaller frogs and toads coming out first in things like your swamps and marshes and vernal pools. And then towards the end of the season, you're gonna have your big frogs and toads starting to warm up finally, and they're gonna be more in your ponds and lakes and they're gonna show up and start calling later in the season, whereas your little ones call earlier in the season. So the whole season though is important and even reporting nothing is important. So I, I don't know if every citizen science program is like this, but we actually even like it when you turn in nothing. <laughs> it's very important. So call intensity would be zero. You don't hear anything. Um, a call intensity of one is we count that when you can hear individual frogs, but there is space. 
So you have one little guy calling and then quiet and then another little guy calling and quiet and then maybe a third guy and quiet. That would be a one. Two is when you can still pick out all those little guys and it is the males calling. So I am right in calling them guys. Um, but two is when you hear the little guys calling, but they're starting to overlap a little bit in their talking. So they're just, you know, talking a little bit to each other and they are starting to overlap a little bit that you can still point out where you hear different ones calling at. And then three is your full chorus. If you're familiar with frogs and toads at all, spring peepers are almost always a full chorus because they are just calling on top of each other. You can't pick out individuals. They're all just screaming and talking and yelling and everything is overlapping and there are no gaps and you can't pick out individuals. And that is, those are the fun nights when you get to hear that. Um, those, are, those are some of my favorites. Next. And that's kind of frog watch in a nutshell. So if anybody has any questions, please put them into the chat. Um, you, if you have more specific questions, you are welcome to email me. I'm the one who checks the frog watch at akronzoo.org email. Um, and I can help you with your questions um, or put you in contact with chapter coordinators all across the United States. If you are not from my area, <laughs> which I did see somebody else in here from Ohio. So that's exciting. Um, but yes, feel free to reach out anytime with questions that you have. Um, you can see we also have information about Frog Watch on the Akron Zoo website. Um, there's a chapter list there where you can see what are some chapters maybe in your, in your state. Um, and you can also, you know, we have uh, Facebook too. You can just search Frog Watch USA on Facebook and find us there. But if you have any questions, please feel free. How do you find out if there is a study in your area, Lorraine County? Um, I would have, shoot me an email and I would have to look and see where would be closest to you. Because we do actually have quite a few chapters in Ohio. So um, yeah, let me, shoot me an email and let me know. Uh, that was excellent and tons of information. And you're too <laughs> unmoving. <laughs> um, excellent. I'm going to, so we can uh, request questions. So if anyone wants to add a question to the chat or the Q&A, go for it. I'm just going to add a couple other steps to our list on how to actually get started um, via the links through SciStarter. So I'll share my screen again to show you what that looks like. Um, if you go on to SciStarter and find Frog Watch, um, that is this website, which I'll just click on to so you can see what it looks like. Looks like this. Hello. And since I'm logged in, I can add it to my actual dashboard, save it to my dashboard for later. Um, and I can look through and see all these resources and also just go to visit. So I'll show you that process. Ta-da. Um, this actually just goes to the field scope. So this is if I'm um, uh, sending in the data immediately. But if you go down to the website, then you can learn more about the Oh, uh-oh. Did I find the wrong one? There is a website, too. Eh. Let's see, I might be just clicking the wrong one. Oh, there we go, Akron Zoo, that's what I'm looking for. Um, and you can learn more. So if you're looking for the place near you, you can do the email or you can also look at um, this one to see the ones that are listed. Um, and Carrie can confirm and connect the dots for you. Um, so that's that part. Um, I also wanted to be able to show you um, the what it looks like on field scope. So since the field scope is where all the data is listed and that's what popped up immediately here. So if I'm in the project already, um, I can go on here and add data. But before I go there, I just wanted to show you more information about um, the joining process. So the fact that they have the observation data sheet, site registration sheet, um, who can join, all the information for you on here too is very useful, um, especially if you get a little deeper into it and get ready to uh, participate with your local chapter. Um, and if you are sending in data, um, because I had a question of whether or not like species matters or how to determine species, I assume that's within the training. And so that's a part of your observation. So um, I assume that's all of your chapters are briefed on the local, uh, local yeah. knowledge. Is that right? Yeah, that's how we, we handle it. Because like I said, I'm in Ohio. I know my Ohio frogs. I do not know Missouri's frogs or Virginia's frogs. So that's why another reason why the local chapters work so well is they do, they provide the training on local frogs and toad species. Um, and then all the training that also goes along with being the citizen science portion. But yeah, so that that's how we learn the, the frogs. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and I did, so there was a question in the chat about if you collect just reports of the sounds like those uh, the number or 
if actual recordings of sounds are useful too. Do you ever recommend uh, recordings of these things? So as of right now, Frog Watch does not require any recordings, but I do have volunteers that choose to record and then they like to go back to their own homes and play the recording and double check themselves. So we have that. And there is a place if you scroll down on that page, Emma, um, where you can upload uh, audio. So you can upload the files to there. And I would recommend doing that. If you have it, go ahead and upload them um, because there may be some point in the future where we start looking at that. But as of right now, we're not requiring it but it's never a bad thing to have. Excellent. If you go to multiple locations or multiple sites, is this a add another one later? I so if you, if you go back up to the top, you can pick, uh, you can either your previous stations or if you click on all stations, Whoa. you can, yep. And you can grab on the drop down and see, you can find your station on that list and then you would pick it and then you'd fill out all of your information, like your observation details, um, your visit information, which has like the start time, end time, temperature, weather, all of that fun stuff. You, yep. And then you'd throw in your frog and toad observation. You can add more than one if you need to. Yep. So you'd like pick one and okay. yep, then put in the intensity and then you could hit the add frog toad and add a second one if you wanted to. Would these ever be in the same room together? African clawed frog. They might be. African clawed frogs are an invasive frog out west. So oh, okay. they're very popular in the pet trade and have been released enough that they're invasive out west. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you go all the way to the bottom after you've entered all of your fun stuff, then you, that's where you would hit. You can either hit save observation or save and add another. And that would allow you to bring you back to this screen. Awesome. Yay. Yeah. yeah. Super so it's, simple it's pretty, process. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty easy. Um, and all of the data fields match up with what is on the observation data sheet that uh, you would receive if you went to a training. So that's kind of what the data sheet looks like there. So you would fill that out and it all matches up with what is on field scope. Amazing. Yeah, not even, no, no better way to do it. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> I like the, um, the fact that the uh, Buford uh, wind scale and the calling intensity, those codings are really, it, it's really nice to be able to do yes. that. I've had that really helpful. <laughs> yeah, it helps keep it, you know, nice and easy to understand. And then it even has the definitions off to the side. There you go. Oh, yeah, there you yeah. go. Easy. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to remember it. You just have to know the code exists. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, Dominic asked in the chat, what is your favorite frog? Do you have a favorite? So I do. My I have to admit my favorite frog is the spring peeper, um, because they are such noisy, but little bitty frogs are only yeah <laughs> yeah they're only about like an inch and a half to two or two inches or so um so they're little bitty frogs but they are one of the noisiest frogs and then a very close second is the wood frog um, which is the in the united states the only in north america the only frog that can live north of the arctic circle and it is the frog i mentioned that will actually freeze solid in the winter and they are studying for organ transplant purposes Oh, wow. Oh, I was hoping they'd have one <laughs> snow or something. That's not the case. Um, <laughs> no, they, they freeze up and live underneath the leaf litter during the winter months. So they're, wow. they're pretty amazing, amazing little frogs. And it has to do with like the sugars in their blood and stuff like that. So it's interesting. But the peepers are my favorite just because they're little bitty and they're noisy. <laughs> and they're the first ones that come out and tell me that it's springtime. Ah, Wait, the, these guys are the ones, oh, because they're smaller, so they yeah. defrost. Yep. The wood frogs actually come out about the same time, but these guys are so noisy that you never, ever hear wood frogs. <laughs> it's like, we're here, we're back. <laughs> exactly, yep. <laughs> they are really cute. They look ready to make a lot of noise with this. Oh, yeah. actually, actually, what is that? How do you, that's, what would you That's their vocal sac. So that is what they inflate in order to make their sounds. Um, some frogs have it right there. Some frogs have it internally more, and some frogs actually have a sac on either side kind of underneath their eyes. Oh, wow. Oh, that's right. Okay. In our, in our video that we posted to Facebook, if you watch there's, it goes, yeah, there's oh, yep. vocal sacs on the sides and yep. the, I only remember the sides, but there were more than that or something, yeah. something else was going on. Um, those are incredible. I wish I knew what the, uh, um, have you ever run into any of the poisonous frogs? So in Ohio, we have some that are like mildly poisonous, but nothing like the poison dart frogs or anything that most people associate. 
Um, those are down in uh, South America, usually in the rainforest. And they're interestingly enough, only toxic if they eat the right food. So oh. um, the, the poison dart frogs have to eat fire ants and they make their toxin from that. Um, and it, like, cause we do have some here at the zoo. That's how I know um, we feed ours crickets. So they're not toxic. Oh, wow. Okay. That's interesting. Huh. <laughs> that's like absorbing someone else's superpower, right? Yep, it's a... Pretty much. Yep. <laughs> wow. And then uh, toads, toads do tend to be toxic. They have little, if you pull up a picture of an American toad, they've got, uh, they called parotoid glands on their shoulders a little bit. Um, and they actually, so yeah, in that picture there, you can see right behind his eye. Well, not that guy's picture, but <laughs> uh -oh. Let's just go back. I'll zoom in here. There you there go. go, right right behind his eye, that kind of lump that, so, nope, go up a little bit. This? Yep, and then over. So go to your, oh. yep, that part right there. That is called their parotoid gland, and they use that to make toxin, and I think most toads have that, but the, it only secretes if they're annoyed. Huh. <laughs> Don't annoy <laughs> your American toads. Right? Dogs and cats tend to annoy them. <laughs> sense. Does the toxin work against... Dogs and it cats? Tend, yeah, it tends to make them like sick to their stomach, make them foam at the mouth. So, yeah. Keep your pets away from these guys. <laughs> Keep them alone. Um, and Kathleen added, uh, oh, yeah. So uh, peepers and wood frogs, it's the wood frogs that freeze solid in the winter, yes, right? Correct. Yeah, because they're the ones who live above the Arctic or in the Arctic Circle area. Yep. Um, and then the peeper frogs, they, so they don't freeze solid. These other frogs do not freeze solid. They just. No, the, the wood frogs are the ones that are known for it. Yep. Okay. Do the others just kind of get cold and fall asleep somewhere? Yeah, more or less. Um, I'm trying to think. I think you call it brumation when yeah, it's in yeah, yeah. amphibians. Yep. Um, so it, it's brumation, torpor, hibernation. They're all very similar. There's, there's scientific differences, but they're all very, very similar processes. So here in Ohio, the frogs and toads do like a brumation or a hibernation in the winter and the wood toads during theirs, they freeze solid. Everybody else just kind of digs down into the mud and goes to sleep. Nice. Nap time. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. All right. I'll push us back. We've answered a lot of questions too, um, from our chat. So I'm glad that that was relevant to all that. Um, and I wanted to also ask the question of, um, how did you actually get started? Like are frogs just your thing? Um, I mean, I do really like frogs and toads. I loved, I'll put my camera back on. Um, I loved learning about them in school and I worked for a while at a national park and loved, loved how kids got so excited about frogs and toads that we would find out in the park and underneath logs and, you know, during um, spring migration and all of that fun stuff. So, and then um, we decided the Akron Zoo wanted to start a local chapter. So um, I volunteered because I think citizen science is super important. Um, and I thought this would be a really good opportunity to be involved more in a citizen science project. And then um, we did that for a few years. Uh, we actually started our chapter in 2017. And then um, when Frog Watch nationally became available, our CEO was super interested in taking it over here and thought I'd be the perfect person since I'd been running our chapter for a few years. So that's kind of how it happened for me. But basically, it's just I do really like frogs and toads, but I just love the education piece and the teaching piece that goes along with citizen science, too. Absolutely. Very awesome reasons. Not that anyone needs a reason to love something, right? No, but those are no. it's great. <laughs> Um, and because you are on uh, for the second time in two weeks, this is especially <laughs> awesome because um, you are involved in the Women in Access Science. So I just wanted to a little push for anyone who is involved or who is uh, listening right now um, to know that this project is connected and will be featured on our One Million Access Science, which is for April, Citizen Science Month. We're celebrating by um, trying to go for One Million Acts within that one month. So if you do participate in Frog Watch USA, um, on here, which is citizenscienceMonth.org or uh, SciStar.org slash Citizen Science Month, um, which I, oh, Roland already put it in there for me. Thank you. Um, that link during April will also send you to a reporting form. So as you participate, tell us about it uh, because that'll lead up to that 1 million X and we can have a, temp I think it'll be a graduated cylinder that'll overflow with some kind of mixture and it's going to be super exciting. So if you do participate, keep this in mind um, and we'll remind you too as someone who's taken part in um, citizen science activities. Um, so we're excited to have you in there. You can even sign up to participate as an individual here if you would like to. So I'll drop that in the chat as well. So 
also something to consider and look around in the meantime. Now, I'm going to close this out um, to the last little bits of our conversation. So I just wanted to pause to say thank you so much, uh, Carrie, for joining us again and talking about this. I'm really excited. I need to figure out where the frogs are in D.C. because I'm not sure where to go for that, honestly. But, you know, city, urban life, got to find somewhere. Um, they do exist. That much I, I do. do know. Yeah. yeah. Being in winter, I'm wondering when I'll, so February through August. So I think, yeah, we'll see when I can start hearing them in certain places. I'll have to take a couple hikes and figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, local retention ponds too are really good options in cities and stuff. So local retention, like the, the adding in ponds, landscaping ponds. Mm -hmm. type yeah. Yeah. Yep. Those work too. Yep. I think there's a duck pond near me. Yeah. I'll have to look it up. Uh, look for ducks, it. You might have frogs. <laughs> Oh, are they buddies? Do they are they Not necessarily? The but if the ducks will live there and eat some of the vegetation and stuff, then that means it's probably a decent site for frogs too. Hmm. There you go. I didn't know that. I'm excited. Sweet. <laughs> uh, for anyone who is interested in learning more about different projects, next week we're talking about monkeys. So if monkeys are exciting to you, definitely come back. Um, we'll talk about monkey health explorer and how you can help the, us understand their behavior um, and also understand human behavior and genetics as well. So it should be pretty interesting. And then the following week, we have our Do NASA Science Live event. So uh, we have a partnership with NASA to do a couple years worth of events with them. And we'll be talking about winter stuff. So what's it mean to be cool? Uh, learning about the comet, icy comet trails to snow on earth, all the um, mysteries of frozen landscapes um, that we learn about through NASA science. So if you're interested in learning more or participating in any of those projects, you can absolutely register um, and join us. We'd love to have you. And um, I think those are the only updates I wanted to give you all, but um, you can always reach us at any of these different methods of contact or support. So on the website, you can ask the community, you can ask project leaders, you can take training so you can find your next project, which definitely will have frogs in it. Um, listen to our podcast, which also will have a little bit about frogs in there too. Um, and you can send us an email anytime at info. Um, Carrie, do you want to um, give us that email in the chat again? It was Akron or it was Frogwatch USA at Akron Zoo for your contact. I can email it too. Oh, there we go. Frogwatch at AkronZoo.org. Perfect. Yeah. So if you want to reach out directly, uh, you can use that email as well for that event. But otherwise, um, thank you all so much for joining us. If you are willing to take our post-event survey, it'll show up once you exit the call too. Um, but Roland did drop the link in the chat. So we're happy to have you all here and we're excited to see you again, hopefully next week or one of the future events. So keep tabs, investigate those frogs, listen very carefully, and don't move for two minutes before you start the observation. <laughs> but I've learned. You got it. You got it. <laughs> Excellent. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Go Thank you, everybody. Home.